Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Scott Cohn. I'm a correspondent with CNBC. I'm a member of the advisory board of the Center for Journalism Ethics and a graduate of the University of Wisconsin School of Journalism and proud of all of them and honored to be able to introduce our keynote speaker for the day, uh, Tony Berman. When I was asked to introduce the uh, Director of Strategy for Al Jazeera English, it reminded me, if you'll indulge me talking about myself for a minute, of a lesson I learned early on while I was a student here at Madison. Uh, I worked for Wisconsin Public Radio. It was about 30 years ago, and my how things have changed. The state and the federal government were in a budget crisis. Yes. There was a brand new Republican reformist governor. And there was an issue about some state employees going on strike, specifically the teaching assistants here at the university. Um, as working for a radio station that was owned by the university, we were in a bit of a tough spot. The university, it seemed, or we felt pressure anyway, to represent the management's view in this labor dispute, but also the, the teaching assistants. We were kind of caught in the middle. We kind of informally decided that as long as we were pissing everybody off equally, we were probably doing our job. <laughs> but that didn't make the pressure any less difficult. And I suspect that Tony is dealing with that kind of pressure on a much larger, much more consequential scale every day. And I'm going to be fascinated to learn how he deals with that. Tony Berman, as I said, is the head of strategy for Al Jazeera and the Americans, the former managing director of Al Jazeera English, a position he held for more than two years from 2008 to 2010. As we all know, uh, Al Jazeera is kind of the channel that everyone seems to love to hate. But if you get a chance to look at it, which is not easy to do in this country, it's some really good stuff. Um, in his current role, Tony, uh, which Tony began last September, uh, based in Washington and Toronto, he oversees uh, Al Jazeera English's efforts to expand its reach and reputation in the U.S. and Canada as the world's leading global news provider. Under his leadership, Al Jazeera English has been widely recognized for its groundbreaking reporting from Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and the Americas. Uh, if you get a chance to look at it, whether it's online, whether it's in another country, or if you're in one of the few places you can see it, you should. Uh, between 2000 and 2007, he was editor-in-chief for CBC News. That's the, the government-owned broadcaster in Canada, the kind of which we don't have in this country. <laughs> um, it, he uh, was the, uh, the editor-in-chief, 2000 to 2007, uh, part of, capping off a 35-year career with the uh, CBC where he won many, many awards, more than 100 awards. Um, and now is taking on a new challenge, an interesting challenge for a very fascinating uh, news outlet that is always navigating this whole issue of objectivity versus partisanship amid all kinds of pressures. And I'm pleased to welcome Tony Berman. Okay, so let's, um, thank you very much. It's a delight to be here. Um, I really want to, if I can start, um, what I'm going to try to do is kind of reshape my remarks so that there's a, a good kind of discussion afterwards, 15 or 20 minutes, because I think that there are a lot of issues that flow from some of the things that I'll be talking about that I think would engage all of you. Uh, but if I can start, not so much as an Al Jazeera representative, but as a Canadian all my life, and a and you probably have heard this before as a Packer fan, who, and I think <laughs> people can recognize that I actually am old enough to remember Vince Lombardi. In fact, when I was in high school, my obsession was football, and I came very close um, from winning a football scholarship to an American university, and my goal was to play for the Packers. S happily for the NFL and sadly for the CBC, I didn't get the scholarship. <laughs> I gave up football. I focused on journalism and the rest is history, but I'm, I can't overstate, although this is not Green Bay, Madison for other reasons which I'll get into is truly special as well, but it's, I'm really delighted to finally be in Wisconsin, close to Green Bay, but I'm really delighted to be in Madison <laughs> because I, I think um, as a resident now of Washington, um, and all Canadians feel that they're charter members of the U.S. observational force, we feel that we're, <laughs> we're more, 
we feel we're more self-righteous and pompous about our views about America than I think any any people on earth. And I've although I've done a lot of travel, obviously, and a lot of work in the U.S. in my journalistic career, kind of living in D.C., particularly during these times, is incredibly exciting and incredibly energizing. Um, and also, dare I say, watching the evolution of events in this state and in this city has really been quite uh, quite amazing. I'm really in awe of being here. Uh, I think without revealing my own uh, opinion of which side has been right, I think it's a, a lesson. It has been a lesson to the world beyond the borders of America in how people should go about identifying their rights, defending them peacefully, intelligently, but aggressively. And watching during the period, particularly in January, as I watched TV switching back and forth from the Capitol Square here in Madison and Cairo's Tahrir Square, I, I must say that although there are different causes, different contexts, I think the causes spring from the same need within us to be treated fairly with respect and with fairness. And I, I think I, I know this story is not over, but it's one that I, like so many people, I think, are watching very closely. Um, the, the theme of this conference is the rise of a more partisan press in the U.S. and elsewhere. And I'd like to kind of approach that really from the perspective of an international news network um, called Al Jazeera and, and try to give you some background as to what we try to do, however flawed we may be. I mean, history, the daily media, I think like all of you know, is history on the run and it's not perfect and we certainly are not perfect, but I think there's an effort going on that is meaningful, I would argue, not only to journalism, but also to those of us, particularly in North America, who care about un better understanding the world. Um, last uh, month, I think as many, some of you may have, all of you probably have heard that S Secretary of State Hillary Clinton kind of put Al Jazeera in the news, much to our surprise. She was defending her State Department budget uh, on Capitol Hill and she said, quote, uh, Al Jazeera is changing people's attitudes and minds. Like it or not, or like it or hate it, it is really effective. U.S. News, she added, was not keeping up. Um, viewership of Al Jazeera is going up in the United States, according to the Secretary of State, because it's real news. You may not agree with it, but if you, you feel like you're getting real news around the clock instead of a million commercials, and you know arguments between talking heads and the kind of stuff that we do on our news, which, you know, is not particularly informative to us, let alone to foreigners. And although we have had, um, I'm not going to get into the background, particularly with the, with the time pressures we have, but I mean, I think you know the history between Al Jazeera and, and the Bush administration. In fact, our relationship as a news organization with the Obama administration since it took over has been very professional and very workmanlike. And um, I think there's been a real effort on our part, on their part, whether it's the State Department or the Pentagon or, dare I say, the White House, you know, to come up with a, um, a working relationship that would kind of benefit both sides. And I think I was part of a meeting in Doha, in Qatar, uh, involving about four or five Al Jazeera people, and the Secretary of State was there about a year ago, and she asked for a meeting. And I, I think the message that I certainly got from the meeting was that the current U.S. government unlike its predecessor, sees Al Jazeera as part of the solution, not part of the problem, particularly in terms of bridging cultures and bringing and lowering the temperature in this world. So in, I think in that sense, what, you know, at the risk of trying to interpret what, what uh, Mrs. Clinton meant, I think what she meant, actually, in a domestic uh, sense, and I think some, uh, much of this became, was part of our discussion earlier today in the various panels was that people, at the end of the day, they want information, particularly people who live in the world's most vigorous and genuine democracy. They want information, um, not only within their, about their community, but about their country and certainly about the wider world. And I think that, I, I guess what she was implying was that the current kind of structure, dare I say, the business model of American broadcast media in particular is kind of runs counter to that. And in that sense, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I, I think um, in terms of Al Jazeera, I mean, it is a, a news channel that is now seen in more than 220 million households worldwide. It's seen in more than 105 countries. It's seen now, as of a year ago, throughout Canada. One of the only countries in the world where it's not seen nationwide is the United States of America. And that I think we know some of the reasons, and I'm really hopeful that six months from now, a year from now, 
we'll look back and realize that the breakthrough has happened. But it's actually, so it's seen in three places in particular, in, in Burlington, Vermont, and Toledo, Ohio, but it's also seen in Washington, D.C., the whole Washington area. And that means that it's gotten incredible visibility and it has incredible profile, and I, I say with a, a, a genuine sense of humility, it has a really positive reputation among the news junkies that you all know, we all know, live in D.C. And that not, is not only the national media that's, that's located there, but also throughout the State Department, throughout the White House, throughout the Pentagon. I was actually in the White House about a week ago because we're in discussions with them on a variety of initiatives, and it was kind of repeated to me what I think one has read several times, that, that because Jazeera is available throughout Washington and, and because of the importance of particularly the so-called Arab awakening, that um, watching Al Jazeera, whether it's in the State Department or the White House, is almost kind of mandatory. And I think what that has done is that has really kind of lifted our profile. So in that sense, I think we hope it's contagious. Now, what I want to do, because I want to get into some of the, uh, the uh, effects of our coverage um, in the Middle East, since, particularly since the middle of December, and I'm going to ask my colleague here to see if we can kind of play a highlights pack with the audio, just to see whether it will in fact work, and then we can talk about it. particularly to those who haven't really had a chance to see Al Jazeera. taken to the streets today are not the 50, 60 activists that we've been seen protesting in Egypt for the past five, six years. These were normal Egyptians. They shot at us. Am I an enemy of the state? I came here to ask just for rights. The protesters have lost their fear. They are determined to continue doing this. It doesn't show any signs of stopping. We are breaking into programming here on Al Jazeera, 11.45 GMT, about quarter to two in the afternoon in Cairo, Egypt. Live continuing coverage here on Al Jazeera of a day of mass protest. They called it a day of rage. It is fast turning into that. The more unbelievable pictures you're seeing there of crowds of protesters trying to dump the vehicle. That is a personnel carry that carries troops of the police. They're trying almost to knock it over the into side the river. of the yeah. bridge into the Nile. Yes, into the Nile. You can see more tear gas being fired at the protesters, uh, and more of them are coming our way. Take your Just time. One second, stay with us. Come on. Ahmed, 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 Ahmed. The president himself, he has tried to appease the public, he has sacked the government, he has appointed a new government, he's tried to announce new initiatives, appoint a vice president, all of that has only brought out more people day after day, day after day. It does not seem uh, that they are going to be easily satisfied unless the president himself stands down. We've lost a lot of people and we've lost them for a cause. The cause is that we wanted Mubarak to be out. We owe it to them to stick it till the end. They are shooting. There are people, with, there are some of the thugs with uh, rifles on, on the bridge and they shot at the, our demonstrators, like the latest of our dead protesters. He was shot right through the head. I had two friends watching this happen. We are not leaving this place. For the journalists who were witnessing it, what you were seeing was a brutality that completely disrupted what had been a very peaceful protest. want as a journalist is to become part of the story you want to report the story but the government the authorities 
almost made us actors in this drama. They accused us of inciting the violence. These are images President Hosni Mubarak will not want Egyptians to see. This is a Fox News alert because Fox News has confirmed that Al Jazeera network has been shut down. Let me just tell you about the targeting of Al Jazeera for our coverage in the last hour or so. Our officers were entered. We believe it was intelligence security. We've also heard that it could be the presidential palace security. They came in, they told us to stop filming. I will stay on the air if I can until the police come. We're going to keep these images for you guys live until we are actually forced off the air either by the police or if our signal is somehow interrupted. The atmosphere in the square is absolutely electric. People have come in there, tens of thousands. There is quite literally standing room only. There's a real sense here that history will be made tonight. President Mohammed Hosni Mubarak has decided to waive the office of the President of the Republic. Listen to that crowd, that's what they've been waiting for. Hosni Mubarak has gone. The images that you are seeing not only important for the people of Egypt, but are undoubtedly going to have that's a wide reverberation. That young man, by the way, Ayman Mohideen, who the was the, the, the reporter at the end and also the one that reported um, the, uh, the truck being um, pushed into the, into the Nile, is an Egyptian-American born in Egypt, brought up in Detroit and somebody who, uh, who's notable, I think, in the media in that uh, when um, Al Jazeera was the only international news organization in Gaza covering both sides of the border, but he was situated in Gaza as one of the two kind of reporters left. And he's done really brilliant work. I think what you see there, I mean, I, I think this was just a, a, an example of, of what was a, um, a, a weeks of coverage that, that not only brought the story to the wider world, but equally important, in some ways even more important, I think particularly from the perspective of the Middle East, it brought the story to, to uh, the Arab world, which is largely an autocratic, dictatorial kind of political environment. And what it reflects, it reflects a news, or news organization that, that uh, invests in reporters and producers, in, in our case, television's case, camera crews on the ground. Uh, we have 70 uh, news bureaus, uh, both the English and Arabic um, services of Al Jazeera, which is more than CNN and more than the BBC. And I think that's the kind of coverage, not only that one sees from the Middle East, but from, Arab, uh, from Africa, from Latin America, from Asia. Uh, as I said, I think in a question earlier today, I mean, by comparison, this country, 300 million people, we, you, you, we now have fewer than 100 foreign correspondents that are attached to uh, the mainstream, the large mainstream news organizations. And that, over time, I mean, has an impact because, again, if I go back to the information is power kind of notion that I think we're, we're all kind of better citizens in a, in a, um, um, in a democratic society if we're informed. Um, let me just give you a bit of background on Al Jazeera. It's been on the air now. Al Jazeera English has been on the air for nearly five years. It has a staff of about 1,000 uh, employees drawn from more than 50 nationalities. It constitutes by far the most diverse news service in the world. There are many of us from the BBC, from CNN, in my case from the CBC, but many more come from Africa, from Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Its staff is as multicultural as is the United States. The key aspect of Al Jazeera English is its global perspective. Our home team is not in London, it's not in Atlanta, it's not in New York, it's not in Toronto, dare I say. We have no home team. As the day unfolds, our broadcast schedule follows the sun. AJE broadcasts to the world from its centers in Asia, the Middle East, Europe, and then finally, if you live in this time zone, the Americas, our large um, operation in Washington. And our objective is to let the world report on itself. Al Jazeera is a public broadcaster, not unlike the CBC in Canada and the BBC in Britain. Although there is substantial revenue coming from program sales and advertising, Al Jazeera is funded primarily by the government of Qatar. And like the CBC and BBC, there is a firewall between the government there and Al Jazeera. 
I was there for nearly two and a half years as in Doha, as the managing director of the English Channel. And I detected no effort at, at, on, at any time on their part, on the government's part, to influence Al Jazeera. When I was in Doha, I actually had zero contact with the government. In fact, when I was in Canada as the CBC's editor-in-chief for more than seven years, I had a clearer sense of what the government there wanted out of its public broadcaster than I did working in Doha. The editorial policy of fair reporting um, on Al Jazeera is exemplified by our journalistic perspective, which is sees the world through the lens of the global south. This is in stark contrast to the other international channels such as CNN and BBC. And I admire both of those channels, but they largely focus on the Western centers of power and reflect sometimes inadvertently, sometimes unabashedly, their own national American and British agendas in their reporting. Another way of putting it is that I think we feel that they cover the policies as they leave the major Western policy centers of power. We cover the policies as they land in the, uh, particularly in the developing world where dare I say, millions, if not billions, of people on this earth live. In a recent academic study of BBC, CNN, and AJE, it was shown that in the period examined, 81% of Al Jazeera's news items were about news and stories of the South, of Africa, Asia, the Middle East, Latin America. This was double that of the BBC and CNN, whose news focused more on Western Europe and the US. Al Jazeera English provides news and information not available elsewhere and from parts of the world that go unreported. In a newscast, if you flicked it on today, you would be hearing news out of three or four countries in Africa, out of three or four countries in South America. You would hear pl from places in Asia that never, rarely penetrate the American or Canadian um, um, living rooms. And that's the norm. You know, and, and, and although I think Al Jazeera Arabic is focused because 98% of its audience lives in the, in the Middle East, our audience does not live primarily in the Middle East. In fact, we have a relatively small audience in, our, in the Middle East, so our coverage responds to those viewers who live in, in North America, uh, hope, and I think in, in the U.S. as well, through, it's through our online streaming, but, but in Latin America, in um, Europe, in Asia, and in Africa. Um, AJE is firmly rooted in regions well beyond the traditional power centers. As, as a result, it has quickly become the leading international news service in Africa and key areas in Asia as well as in the Middle East. Al Jazeera English also serves as a bridge to the understanding of other cultures. Uh, evidence of this is a 2008 American academic study of AJE's impact in six countries in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, and the United States. It revealed that more than any other channel, uh, viewers found, it, found Al Jazeera English to function as, quote, a conciliatory media, more likely to cover contentious issues in a way that contributes to cooperation, negotiation, and reconciliation. And that actually is, and I say this at the risk of sounding like a, uh, a, you know, a, a naive idealist, but I mean, the, the group of people that I worked with in Doha and the group of people that I still associate with here in America, I mean, do see the world, and again, from 50 nationalities, do see the, the, the one of the ch chief principles, pre, uh, one of the principal objectives of media really is to build bridges, is to solve problems, is to help people kind of come to solutions, not only to get eyeballs to advertisers. Al Jazeera English is a standalone channel within Al Jazeera, separate in staff and editorial direction from Al Jazeera Arabic. It's part of the Al Jazeera broadcast group, but a separate member of it. It operates not unlike Rupert Murdoch's News Corporation, just as his Times of London, Sun Newspaper, Sky News, and the Fox TV network all have independent voices, priorities, and brands within Murdoch's one international multimedia company, so does Al Jazeera English. Al Jazeera English is available and popular in Britain, and it's regulated by Ofcom, the respected and tough UK body which oversees that country's broadcasters. Like the BBC, ITV, and Channel 4, AJE is required to adhere to Ofcom's very strict broadcast code that deals with issues of impartiality and fairness. This is the body to which viewers appeal if anything they see offends them. In more than four years of broadcasting, AJE has never experienced a problem with, with Ofcom. One kind of side reference, if I can make, given the fact that we're talking about the partisan news, Fox News could never be broadcast in 
Britain because it would violate Ofcom uh, regulations. But Al Jazeera English does. AJE journalists are also required to follow Al Jazeera's code of ethics, which is available on our website, aljazeera.net uh, forward slash English, English. It's precisely the same type of strict code which governs, governs journalistic quality and integrity at the BBC and CBC. Again, in more than four years of broadcasting, AJE has never experienced a problem in violation of its ethics. Um, I think the one of the important parts, although I think if you watch the channel, and again, many people in America, I think, whether it's online or in Washington have, uh, you know, I think you'll, one will realize that it's not a Middle Eastern-centric channel, but it has special pride in its coverage of the Middle East. Again, the goal here is not to push a line or cater to a bias. The goal is far more revolutionary. We simply want, want people to understand the full story and not a narrow one. I think an obvious example I think has been our coverage of the Arab awakening. I think two years ago, as I said earlier, um, Al Jazeera English gained international acclaim through its coverage of the Gaza-Israeli war. AJE was the only international English news channel that covered both sides of the conflict, not only from within Gaza itself, Ayman Mohuddin being our senior correspondent there, but also throughout Israel, including southern Israel, with more journalists and crews than any of our competitors. Praise for AJE during the Gaza-Israeli conflict came from the Financial Times, The Economist, The Guardian, Le Monde in Paris, the Columbia Journalism Review, The New York Times, and the Haaretz newspaper in Israel. One thing I should mention about Israel is that when I say it's AJE is broadcast in more than 100 countries, it's, it's widely watched in Israel, and it's been available in Israel for several years. And day in and day out, Israeli politicians speak directly on Al Jazeera on both its Arabic and English channels, more than on any other network in the world outside of Israel. That actually was one of the first notable achievements of Al Jazeera Arabic when it was created in 1996 by the Emir of Qatar. For the first time in history, the Arab world directly saw and heard Israelis speaking freely, frequently, live and unedited. That was groundbreaking. Until then, traditional Arab journalism had been limited to state-run propaganda machines, usually serving very narrow interests. Al Jazeera originated in one of the world's smallest countries and perhaps one of the most liberal of the Gulf states. Qatar is beside Saudi Arabia, jutting out into the Arabian Gulf on a peninsula. That, that actually is what Al Jazeera means in English, peninsula. Qatar's capital, Doha, is not nearly as racy as Dubai. In fact, it's rather quiet. Doha regards itself as education city. More than a dozen European and North American universities have campuses there. Qatar has diplomatic relations with Israel, the only Arab country that doesn't directly border Israel to do so. And it's a staunch U.S. ally. It also hosts one of the largest American military bases in the world. And I think as many of you will know that uh, Qatar has been the leading Arab country that's been involved in the uh, initiative in, in Libya with, with its own jets. And I think uh, the uh, emir of Qatar was actually uh, at the U.S. Islamic Forum in Washington uh, yesterday and the day before, and I'm told, although I didn't see it, I'm told that he was on CNN interviewed by Wolf Blitzer. Relations between the Emir, between Qatar's ruler and the U.S., are close. They have occasionally been strained because of Al Jazeera, but this is fairly recent. The Emir created Al Jazeera in 1996 to challenge the smothering media climate of censorship within the Arab world. He hired hundreds of Arabic speakers who had been working at the BBC, and Al Jazeera quickly became, as it is today, the Arab world's most popular and respected news channel by a wide margin. Al Jazeera gave voice to a multitude of views that, for the first time, reflected the mood and moment of the Arab world. And I think that all kind of came to the, to the head since December, the, when Tunisia led to Egypt and then led to Yemen and, and beyond. In addition to its Arabic main channel, it has a smaller channel that broadcasts live speeches, seminars, and sermons. It's like a C-SPAN that has been proudly uncensored since its creation. And in the Arab world, that's a triumph. On very rare occasions, not often, personal views expressed on this live channel by certain speakers, views not held by Al Jazeera itself, have been outrageous. Angry, hateful words about Israel and Jews, just as there have been angry, hateful words voiced in the Israeli media about Arabs and Muslims. No one in this painful, bitter dispute has a monopoly on virtue. Al Jazeera's hallmark has always been fearless reporting and wide open debate, regardless of what controversy this triggers. 
This often challenges the rich and the powerful, and it has enraged authoritarian Arab governments throughout Al Jazeera's 15 years history. And I think I really want to emphasize that because I think in my experience in talking to Canadian and American audiences, the most dominant kind of notion that people have understandably of Al Jazeera would be its tensions, particularly with the American government, the, the Bush uh, administration. But in reality, if one t wants to talk about the tensions between Al Jazeera and governments, the, it's the tensions between Al Jazeera and authoritarian dictatorial Arab governments since 1996 that have really been kind of the, 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 the daily and weekly um, pressure on Al Jazeera. And it's widely, it's, it's not widely known here and it's, it's not acknowledged un, unless one has really becomes aware of it. Uh, Al Jazeera journalists at one time or another have been temporarily thrown out of many Arab countries. In fact, at the last Arab summit, several governments denounced Al Jazeera for being too critical of the Arab world. And you probably think of Al Jazeera as the hated nemesis of the American government. In fact, Al Jazeera until 9-11 in 2001 was seen by Western governments, including the Clinton White House in the U.S., as the poster child for a strengthening Arab democracy. And then it changed. Shortly after 9-11, as we all recall, in November 2001, the U.S. government attacked the Taliban in Afghanistan. It claimed no civilians were being killed in the bombing. Al Jazeera, not surprisingly, was the only news organization inside Afghanistan, and it had the temerity at the time to report that, yes, civilians were being killed. And it was from that time that the kind of civil war between the Bush administration and Al Jazeera began. I just want to kind of spend a couple of minutes just talking about kind of the wider context of, of international coverage, and then I'd love to get into some sort of discussion about some of the issues that you see. But I, I think in my experience, uh, doing a lot of international coverage with the CBC, doing a lot of coverage with the CBC in the Middle East, but probably most importantly living in the Middle East, in the Gulf, uh, uh, heading Al Jazeera English for two, two and a half years, has really kind of uh, underscored to me the kind of the delicacy of this period. We live in an incredibly challenging world. I suspect historians will one day judge this as a defining period in this 21st century. The centers of global power are shifting. In historic and even epic terms, the ground is moving beneath our feet. Power is shifting from the West, from the United States, to China, to India, to other parts of the developing world where the world's new 21st century economy is taking place. Not, coincid not coincidentally, that is where Al Jazeera largely resides. After, after the rise of the West for the past hundreds of years, it's now the rise of the rest as Fareed Zakaria once put it. That doesn't mean we're moving or entering an anti-American world, but we're moving into a world that is defined and directed from many places and by many people. And we have to know that world. The world's current financial problems are not helping. Their aftershocks shocks are having a devastating effect on many news organizations. At a time when coverage of the world is more important than ever and global is becoming the new local, our window on the world is increasingly being closed. Throughout North America and Western Europe, journalists, as, you all, as we all know, are being laid off. U.S. media companies, and my focus here mainly is on broadcast media companies, many of them still quite rich are cutting back. International coverage and investigative journalism are at risk. Last year, surveys of American news media indicate the percentage of news devoted to international stories was the lowest in more than 20 years. And this sadly comes at a time when people have never been more in need of fearless, independent, public service journalism, particularly coverage of the world. Famous uh, American journalist Walter Lippmann once wrote that the press should be, quote, like the beam of a searchlight that moves restlessly about bringing one episode and then another out of darkness into vision. As we entered the 21st century, the worldwide information explosion raised hopes that journalism's noblest goals were actually attainable, but this was premature. The turbulence of this past decade, not its tranquility, has defined this period, and in many cases, the news media have been passive at best or even complicit as world, as world events spiraled out of control. The list of these events have been long, growing conflict in the Middle East and beyond religious and political extremism, increased worries about climate change, immigration and vanishing borders, the specter once again of potential nuclear conflict and of course the financial meltdown that threatens to deepen poverty and despair in many developing countries. As a consequence, many in the world's industrialized countries have turned inward. Instead of greeting this new century with openness and hope, they have become more protective of what they have and more fearful that in this uncertain future they may lose it. The response by the world's news media to these events 
has been mixed, even contradictory. In the developing world, there have been aggressive, uh, aggressive efforts to expand coverage of the world. These have provided alternative voices to the Anglo-American monopoly of CNN and BBC that has long dominated the world of international journalism. The most notable example, obviously, has been in the Middle East with Al Jazeera and its, it its many competitors, a development that is inspiring similar initiatives in Asia and Africa. In contrast, many of the world's largest commercial news organizations, particularly American, still rich by most measurements, have gone the opposite way. They have mirrored their sense of the public mood by reducing world coverage. Reacting to pressure from shareholders, they have drastically cut back their international bureaus and shrunk the relatively small amount of space and airtime they still devote to foreign news. The late CBS news anchor Walter Cronkite gave a somber warning shortly before his death. He said that pressures by American media companies to generate ever greater profits threatened the very freedom the U.S. was built upon. He said today's journalists face great challenges, that greater challenges than those from his generation. No longer could journalists count on their employers to provide the necessary resources, he said, to, quote, to expose truths that powerful politicians and special interests often did not want exposed, close quote. Instead, he concluded they face rounds and rounds of job cuts and cost cuts that require them to do ever more with ever less. In the full sweep of history, one could argue this is precisely the time when understanding other cultures is a necessary prerequisite to truly understanding your own. As a justification for reducing costly international coverage, it has been irresistible for some American companies to blame the victim, in this case the audience, as in, quote, people don't actually care about foreign news in America. But this is self-serving. It tries to absolve journalists and programmers from blame for boring or confusing their audiences. There is considerable research in North America suggesting that superficial coverage of the world is the most important contributor to public ap apathy. What is also being ignored in another, is, is another crucial role of news organizations to provide news they believe the public needs to know to become better informed citizens. There used to be a time when major media companies were motivated, motivated by a sense of public duty. They maintain strong, well-resourced news divisions as a form of payback for access to the cherished public airwaves and the immense profits this produced. And this was per perhaps best summed up in the 1950s in the United States when Bill Paley, founder of CBS, as I think many of you recall, was once quoted as saying, in effect, I make my money on Jack Benny so I can afford to do the best news. So why isn't that sense of public spirit uh, evident today? Well, the one quick answer could be, well, no, no, the American media companies, the American broadcast co companies are in financial trouble. Are they in financial trouble? The, in terms of the latest figure, CBS, last year, 2010, they earned more than $724 million three times the year before. NBC Universal, owned by General Electric, fourth quarter of last year, they earned $830 million in income, 40% more than the year before. Disney, the owner of ABC, fourth quarter last year, they earned $1.3 billion, about 50% more than a year before. So, you know, the argument that American broadcast companies are impoverished is nonsense. Turning the world off may be therapeutic to some, but it is no longer, it is no long-term solution. The long march of history shows us that. There are signs that interest in global news coverage is increasing in the developing world, in Europe, perhaps in Canada, but not yet appears in this country. And this is ironic given the ubiquitous international influence of the world's last remaining superpower. So what's going on? Why would one of the world's most educated, sophisticated countries with so much at stake in major international issues be seemingly so disinterested in world affairs? A few years ago, the Pew Research Center published a revealing analysis that offered an answer. It argued that the media, not their audience, should take the rap. The audience, the survey offered powerful evidence that broad interest in international news is, mostly, is most limited by the public lack of background in this area. They simply don't understand why these stories are important and the media mostly make little effort to help them. There is a circular pattern that becomes evident when examining the treatment of interna international news by many news organizations. Coverage is very costly, therefore it is limited. Being limited, it is superficial and almost and often confusing. Being all of the above, the public turns off. And since the public turns off, costs are even more reduced. And the self-fulfilling pattern plays on. A survey released last year in the US indicated that American trust in the news media was at a record low. Nearly two thirds of Americans think the news stories they read, hear, and watch are frequently inaccurate. 
This probably would have come as no surprise to the late Neil Postman. He was the American media and cultural critic, as I think all, many of you, all of you probably know, who in 1985 wrote his provocative analysis of television, amusing ourselves to death. In that book, Postman argued that American television, particularly American television news, treats serious issues as entertainment. This is 1985. It demeans political discourse by making it less about ideas and more about image. As Postman put it, quote, when a population becomes distracted by trivia, when cultural life is redefined as a perpetual round of entertainment, when serious public conversation becomes a form of baby talk, when in short, a people become an audience and their public business a vaudeville act, then a nation finds itself at risk. Culture death is a clear possibility, end quote. Many years from now, when historians reflect on this decade, I believe their judgment of the media's performance during these years will be harsh. And I speak that in, in some ways less as a representative of Al Jazeera, more as a 35-year-old veteran of the CBC. Looking at the state of the world, current state of the world, it is difficult not to conclude that disastrous decisions have been made by political leaders in an environment of ignorance and arrogance. And in these, these disasters were condoned by a public that largely chose to look the other way in a news media that was at various times complicit or incompetent. That's certainly not how this decade was supposed to turn out. And as the world becomes more dangerous, this should give us all motivation to set it right. Thank you very much for your attention.